Okay. We're pleased to hear about Deborah's research and uh, yes, you may start. So I'm going to talk about my work on the ecology of collective behavior and how collective behavior responds to changing conditions. So I'm interested in collective behavior because uh, I'm interested in systems without central control. Um, here's an example of a school of fish that turns without any leader and uh, systems without central control are widespread um, in nature. So what characterizes them is that uh, there's nobody in charge. It's not directed by anybody. It's um, usually a distributed process that uses local interactions. And really what we try to understand is what are the algorithms that produce collective behavior from simple interactions? So in thinking about that, I wanna distinguish the outcome, that's the behavior that we see from the process that generates that outcome. So the outcome is that the school of fish turns, the herd of wildebeest moves across the savanna, but different outcomes um, may arise from the same process and different processes may give an outcome that looks similar. So we can't tell what is the process that generates it just by looking at the outcome. And what I'd like to suggest is that evolution shapes collective behavior so as to uh, uh, create a correspondence between the algorithm or the process that generates collective behavior and the environment in which it operates. And in particular, that the dynamics of the algorithm and the dynamics of the environment will fit. And that is what allows uh, nature to produce collective outcomes that are responding to changing conditions. So just as uh, the polar bear's fur has evolved in relation to temperatures and uh, changes in temperature, so collective behavior is evolving in relation to changing conditions. So when I talk about changing conditions, I wanna talk in particular about three aspects of the environment and their dynamics. One is the probability of change and threat or stability. Um, another is the relationship between uh, the intake of energy or whatever the system is using and the outflow, so energy flow, and finally resource distribution, how that changes uh, over time. And when I talk about the uh, algorithms, there are uh, three features of those dynamics that I want to talk about. One is amplification, how quickly it changes. Another is the kind of feedback regime it uses, whether um, a simple feature of that feedback is whether the default is to stop and it has to be activated or the default is to keep going and it has to be inhibited. And finally, modularity, how information is distributed throughout the system. So the idea um, that I wanna suggest is that um, if we think about a sort of dynamical landscape um, for the environment of a, of a collective uh, system in nature, that if we were to be able to situate that um, environment on a scale uh, for, for example, these axes, uh, stability, energy flow, and resource distribution, that we would then see when we look at the algorithm that generates the collective behavior, we would see a match or a fit or a correspondence in the dynamics of that algorithm. For example, the kind of feedback it uses, how it amplifies, and the modularity of the system so that there's this correspondence between the dynamics of the environment and the dynamics of the process that produces collective behavior. So I work on ants and ants are a great uh, opportunity to think about this kind of correspondence between environment and collective behavior because there are more than 14,000 species of ants and they live in every conceivable habitat with very different kinds of environmental dynamics. Um, they all have in common that they live in colonies consisting of uh, one or more reproductive females that we call queens, but who don't have any kind of authority or power. They don't tell anybody what to do. They just lay the eggs. And they, uh, all the ants that you see walking around are sterile female workers. And most uh, species of ants can't see. They communicate um, through smell, and they communicate then through very simple interactions. So most of the interactions are olfactory. Ants smell with their antennae, 
And when you see one ant touching another with its antennae, it's smelling the other ant. Ants are covered with a layer of grease uh, called cuticular hydrocarbons that carry odors that ants can use to recognize whether another ant belongs to the same nest and what task it's been doing. And then another uh, perhaps more familiar form of olfactory interaction is when ants put down a, a very volatile uh, uh, chemical on the ground or the substrate where they're walking. Um, it evaporates quite quickly, but if another ant comes along before it is evaporated, uh, they will follow it and that's how they make trails. So what we think about is how these networks of very simple interactions in the aggregate produce the collective behavior of colonies and how that differs in different, in different species in different environmental conditions. So I want to give you two examples. Uh, one of a system where uh, the conditions are very stable, the resources are scattered, not patchy. Uh, water is limited and there is very little uh, threat. So um, there's not much uh, probability of any kind of drastic threat. Uh, in contrast with, um, and that's in the desert, in contrast with the tropical forest, um, which is very unstable, things change quite quickly, the resources are patchy, and there are many more threats. So for the desert, um, I have been studying for a long time a population of seed eating colonies in um, uh, the, uh, right at the state line between um, New Mexico and Arizona in the southwest US uh, near the Mexican border. They're called harvester ants because they eat seeds. So they travel um, from the nest on trails that can extend about 20 meters, uh, uh, forage for seeds, um, search for seeds, and bring them back into the nest. And what I want to talk about is the uh, process that regulates foraging effort. So these are foraging, these, uh, the species are foraging for seeds that are scattered by the wind and flooding. They don't make pheromone trails. There's no point if an ant finds a seed, there's no point recruiting other ants to that spot because they're not likely to be more seeds. Um, here's a video of uh, the ants coming in and out of the nest. Um, so that's the nest entrance and uh, foragers are coming in. You may be able to see foragers carrying something and foragers are leaving. And what I wanna talk about is how this process is regulated without any central control. So, Part of the constraints here are that water is limited and foraging is regulated in response to humidity. An ant loses water just by being outside in the desert air. And uh, when conditions are humid, like uh, during the summer monsoon season, <clears throat> there's more food because uh, the ants eat the seeds of annual plants. And when it rains more, there's more seeds, so there's more to eat. But also the air is more humid, so an ant can afford to be outside longer. But when it's dry, then not only is there less food, but an ant loses more water just being out walking around. So basically there's a trade-off for the colony. They have to spend water to get water. Um, they lose water by being out searching for seeds and they get their water by metabolizing the fats out of the seeds that they eat. And the way that colonies manage this trade-off is that a outgoing forager does not leave the nest until it gets enough contact with returning foragers with food. So this is a video taken with a videoscope inside the nest and uh, you see an ant now coming in and the ants coming up towards us are outgoing foragers that are going to use the rate at which they meet returning foragers to decide whether to leave the nest. So we know about this from experiments in which we decrease the rate at which foragers return by um, uh, picking them up and uh, putting them in, our, our, um, in a plastic box. So this is forager rate on the time scale of minutes. These are very brief experiments. Uh, here you see uh, some students out uh, collecting the returning foragers and putting them in the box. And uh, when we do this, we see after a short lag, which is interesting, a decrease in the rate at which foragers are going out. And it's a larger decrease than can be accounted for by the numbers of ants that are stuck in the box. So here's what the data really look like. The red is the rate at which foragers are coming in. The blue is the rate at which foragers are going out. This is a 14 minute experiment. For three minutes, uh, the green bar shows the returning foragers. So when we collect the returning foragers, the rate at which they go in declines and so does the rate at which they go out. Then when we stop removing the returning foragers, after a little lag, the returning foragers start coming back and the rate at which they go 
in, they come in increases and after a little lag, the rate at which they go out decreases. And what is uh, really fascinating about this to me, and I hope will be fascinating to people who think about statistical physics is actually how very stochastic it is and how the ants um, who are um, never really do anything deterministic and uh, are dealing with very noisy input are still able collectively to regulate the foraging of the whole colony in response to a change in this um, in the rate at which the ants are coming in. So um, the first uh, real model we did of this was in collaboration with Balaji Prabhakar, who is a computer scientist, and we were able to um, to uh, capture the rate at which the ants go out from the rate at which the ants go in. Um, Balaji noticed this analogy between the way that uh, TCP IP, um, a protocol for uh, managing data transmission on the internet works. Um, um, similarly, um, a data packet does not leave the computer until it gets an acknowledgement from the router that the previous packet was able to go on. And, um, in the same way, the ants are not leaving the nest until they get the acknowledgement from returning foragers that uh, food is coming in at a sufficient rate to warrant the expenditure of sending ants out. And Balaji uh, came up with the idea of calling this relationship the internet. So here's a, um, uh, shows one of the results from that model in which we, uh, the red shows the rate at which ants were going in. Um, the Green shows the, the simulated rate at which ants were going out um, in our model, and the blue shows the rate at which they really were going out. So we were able to capture pretty well um, the, how the rate at which ants comes in corresponds to the rate at which they go out. So um, moving on from this, though, um, uh, working with Naomi Leonard um, and uh, Renato Pagliara uh, at Princeton, um, we were able to um, use control theory to write a model um, that captures the whole process with the open loop of the um, incoming foragers who interact with returning foragers, the response, uh, sorry, the, the, with outgoing foragers, the incoming foragers who interact with the foragers inside the nest, ready to go out on their next trip, their response, uh, they become the outgoing foragers that go out collect seeds, come back and stimulate the incoming foragers. So that is the, the outer uh, closed loop. And I wanna tell you a little bit more about that. So the interaction rate of the incoming foragers and the outgoing foragers is linked to food availability. And to understand that, you need to know that um, every, a forager does not return unless it's got a seed. So there's higher foraging effort when more food is available. More food means less er search time, the foragers return sooner, more foragers go out to forage. So it's this kind of simple uh, positive feedback. And um, to understand that a little bit more deeply, we wanted to ask how does a particular ant, how does an individual ant assess interaction rate? So uh, we think it works something like this by analogy with a neuron that each interaction stimulates some neurophysiological response that has a decay. So that if an ant gets enough um, stimulation in the form of uh, these olfactory encounters, uh, smelling returning foragers, it pushes it over some threshold where it's likely to go out to forage. But if it gets the next interaction after all the previous ones have decayed, then it's sort of forgotten anything ever happened and it um, has to start over again. So uh, we've been exploring this analogy between ants as neurons, because just as a forager uses the rate at which it's stimulated by returning foragers to decide whether to leave the nest, so a neuron uses the rate at which it's stimulated by other neurons to decide whether to fire. And um, like the decay in the picture I just showed you, in a neuron, the uh, charge can uh, leak out the axon. It actually physically leaks out the, the axon. And so this process in uh, neurons is called uh, leaky integration. Um, so we were able to look at this in ant colonies in the field by digging up um, the upper surface of the soil and looking at the ants inside this chamber, just inside the nest, where the returning foragers are interacting with the outgoing foragers. So it looks like this. Uh, we put a piece of glass over it to keep the humidity high. And the ants carrying something are uh, carrying pieces of millet, so they're returning foragers. And we wanted to understand how they interact, that is how they have antennal contact in which one ant smells another, 
with the ants inside the nest that are waiting to go out again. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, this is a tunnel and there and there, those are tunnels to the deepest nest. So this is the chamber just inside the nest entrance. The ants are coming in here and we're looking at the response of the ants that have come up from the deeper nest um, to these ants that are returning. And so that's where this picture comes from that I uh, started with. Um, each of these lines is the trajectory of an ant. Each dot is an antennal contact. Um, in the upper left here, so um, I don't think my cursor is showing, there's a small white line that is the size of an ant. And so you can see that the, um, in this uh, uh, video, the nest entrance was in the upper left and there were two tunnels to the deeper nest. And the different colors correspond to the different types of ants. The foragers that came in um, met other ants and went down into the nest. The foragers that came in and went out again, the ones that came up from the tunnel and um, met foragers and went out and the ones that came up from the tunnel um, didn't meet enough foragers and went back down. So we were able to use data like these to parameterize a model, um, working with uh, Mark Goldman, who's a theoretical neuroscientist, and Jacob Davidson, um, in which we treat each ant as a leaky integrator of its interactions. Um, here's the model um, or picture of uh, how we were thinking about it that uh, corresponds really to the picture I just showed you, except that we've added um, the blue line, the return to the deeper nest, uh, which neurons don't do, but what ants do, um, as we know from experiments, is that when ants don't get enough interactions, outgoing foragers don't go out and instead return to the deeper nest. So there's the equation and it was a good fit to the data. Um, so we think that this is a pretty good um, description of how ants inside the nest are assessing their interaction rate and deciding whether or not to leave. So um, the forager decisions depend on interaction rate, um, but the response to interactions depends on current humidity. So that's how humidity comes into it. So um, inside the nest, uh, we know from recording the conditions inside the nest, the humidity is quite constant. But it, outside the nest, the humidity changes in the course of a day and from one day to the next, uh, depending on the weather. And it's when an ant goes outside that it responds to its, uh, that it can respond to humidity. So um, what we, uh, what seems to be happening is that um, the ants that have been outside and know how bad it is, then um, that modifies their response to interactions with returning foragers. So the open loop is the part where the ants go back outside. So this is just a, a schematic of this model in which we um, treat the, um, the interactions inside the nest uh, as um, excitable dynamics. And we then use the um, rate at which the foragers have been outside and the changing conditions um, to do the outer um, open loop. And um, I'm um, telling you a little bit about this model in um, some detail because uh, this is a model and I think it captures the basic process pretty well, but we now have data that we didn't have when we published this to parameterize this model and I'm hoping that there will be people um, listening who might be interested in working with us on that. So um, another part of our work is to ask how natural selection is shaping the collective regulation of foraging and how this is currently evolving, um, but I'm going to um, skip over that in order to uh, just summarize that um, here we have a, a system in which um, the seeds, the, the crucial resources are changing very slowly. It's quite stable. And the feedback is to default, is default stop. That is, don't go out. If you're a forager, don't go out unless there's enough food coming in to make it worthwhile. And the information is centralized. That is, an ant has to go all the way out, collect a seed, come back before it brings back any information to the system. So that system is itself quite slow uh, to respond. And I want to, and so I want to suggest um, that, you know, in these conditions where um, the um, amount of, uh, of energy they're getting, the amount of water they're getting for what they have to spend is quite low. The probability of change is quite low and the um, distribution is actually quite uniform. It's not patchy. Um, we see this kind of algorithm that doesn't really change very quickly where the um, feedback has the default is to stop and the modularity is quite low. And so I want to contrast this with um, a very different system that I'll tell you about very quickly. Um, in the tropical forest, um, 
which is um, everything changes quite quickly. Um, this is work that I've done in um, uh, uh, wonderful research stations belongs to um, UNAM on the uh, um, west coast of Mes Mexico in Jalisco. And uh, the ants are called turtle ants. Um, one of them in this picture has nail polish on it. They're not really purple. They live in the trees. They never come down. And this is a very different kind of system. Um, the tropical forest um, changes quite quickly. Um, the activity is very easy for ants because the humidity is high, but the threats from other species are high. And um, none of the ants in that video are turtle ants, but just to show you that in the tropical forest, any resource that any species of ant wants, there's another species around. Um, that wants it to. So these ants live in the trees. They never come down. They uh, make a very convoluted network in the trees and they're working in a network of vegetation like this where um, there are a lot of junctions where the ants have to make a choice about which way to go. And they put down a volatile pheromone as they go. So unlike the ants in your kitchen, they're not recruiting to a particular food source. Everywhere they go, they put down a pheromone and when they come to a junction, then they take the junction that is most recently reinforced by other ants. So you can think of the trails as a network within the network of vegetation. Um, this is a, a, a hub and uh, these are edges and the ants are choosing in this particular um, moment, they're choosing this edge, this edge, and this edge, and not that one. Um, so you have three minutes. Two minutes? Three, three. Three. Well, I guess then I will skip past um, the details of this. Um, uh, what we've been doing is to, is to trace these networks um, day after day and look at how they change. Um, uh, they uh, make amazing, um, amazingly effective uh, networks and repairs in a very uh, convoluted and dense network of vegetation. Uh, vegetation. Um, and uh, trying to understand how they search, how they explore, how they repair the network with experiments like this in which we cut a vine and look to see how they recover. Um, so for example, here the red line shows, um, the gray line shows what they were doing before I came along with my shears and the red looks like how they recover. Um, this is a pretty straightforward example, but, um, and there they are, there's the cut um, edge. Um, this is a more complicated problem that I set for them. Um, and the response was also more complicated where they um, find multiple pathways across the edge, but um, eventually uh, create a, a shorter path. Um, and um, working with Sakit Navlaka uh, and Arjun Chandra Sekar, we've been able to uh, figure out um, an algorithm that describes pretty well how they do this um, with only two parameters. One is the probability of, uh, you could call it exploration or making a mistake of taking an edge with less or no pheromone and um, the rate of pheromone decay, that is how quickly the pheromone evaporates. Um, so using simulations and uh, we were able to um, uh, show that the, the um, parameter values that are most successful in simulations um, fit uh, very well the actual observed parameter values, the probability of exploration and the rate of pheromone decay, which uh, doesn't prove that that's what the ants are doing, but suggests that our algorithm is consistent with what they're doing. And we've now moved on to think about um, the physical conditions that regulate flow through a node. So um, if a node is very simple, like the one marked here in A, Every ant takes pretty much the same path and it's much more likely to be reinforced quickly. When um, it's complicated, every ant goes a different way and because their antennae are so short, they can't smell at a distance. And so um, they can, they're much more likely to use a path that is reinforced more rapidly. And so we looked uh, carefully at the different kinds of physical configuration of the junctions that they're using. Um, this is a, a illustration of a particular network, um, not just the path that the ants are using, but all of the uh, nodes, five nodes around it that they could have chosen. And then we simulated um, random networks and compared that with the networks that the ants actually do create and found that they don't actually take the shortest path. Um, they're not much different in length from the random network, but they tend to minimize um, the number of nodes and they tend to minimize this um, uh, difficulty of uh, repeating a transit 
the transition so that they are much more likely to flow through the nodes that are physically um, easiest to reinforce. So um, in general, what we see here is um, a system of very local regulation that's decided node by node. It just keeps the, the network going. So in contrast to the harvester ants, here's a situation where the environment changes very quickly. The vines are broken, the, um, the leaves grow, um, the, the network changes all the time. There's other species that they have to deal with. Um, they're looking for patchy resources like nectar um, in a very complicated network. Um, and it changes quite rap rapidly. And the feedback is set that the default is to just keep going no matter what. And they're using very local information which allows them to adjust more rapidly. So to get back to my um, picture where um, the, um, it's, it's uh, relatively cheap for them to keep going, the resources are patchy, the probability of change is quite high, we see an algorithm that can um, react quite quickly uh, with very high modularity, local regulation, and the feedback is set to keep it going. So um, that is the contrast I wanted to make between the environmental conditions in which the system is working and the um, kinds of algorithms or processes that are using local interactions to regulate behavior. Um, and I hope that I've um, um, given you um, the sense that we would expect to look around in nature and to see these kinds of correspondences and to um, try to see if there are general patterns uh, for the fit between the dynamics of collective behavior and the dynamics of um, the environments that they're working in. So I will stop there and um, thank all the people that have uh, come out to um, help with this work and my funding sources and my collaborators. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah, for a super interesting talk. And there's lots of questions, and we won't have time to get to most of them. But um, I'll skip to the, I mean, we'll get to a lot more during the informal chat uh, okay. at the end, but we're running a little behind. So I'll skip to uh, kind of the end. Um, I'll, you know, I'll skip around a little bit. And uh, Josh Alper asks Is the decision threshold a function of the food in the nest? In other words, do the ants make a riskier choice to forage if the reserve of food is low? Uh, that's a great question, and we don't know the answer to that. But um, we do know that the ants that are foraging are living in the top part of the nest. These nests go down for about two meters. And so there um, has to be some um, other process that links food supply to how the foragers are making their decisions. So there's a third um, part of it also that most of the food of an ant colony goes to feed the larvae. So there's not just how much food they have, but how much food they need, which depends on a seasonal cycle of the production of larvae. So I think that there probably, um, that there must be uh, processes that link food supply, the production of the juveniles and the foraging um, the only clue we really have about that is that um, younger, quickly growing forager, uh, younger, quickly growing colonies are more persistent in foraging than um, older ones or really young ones, suggesting that the um, the proportion of uh, the the ratio of uh, larvae to feed to foragers matters for how much they forage. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, the very last question we've gotten so far is uh, Rudro Biswas asks, uh, from the two points in the graph, can we extrapolate to some law for which uh, environments are habitable? Does that question make sense to you? Yes, I mean, that's a great <laughs> idea. So we would be able to map out not just the correspondences that we see, but the ones that are impossible. Uh, the ones that, that could not uh, be occupied. That's an interesting idea. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, and I think maybe we have time, uh, maybe one more. Uh, so a lot of people are interested in how the foragers return, um, how they, uh, 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 Shri, um, 
I've and how they navigate their way back? You, well, how they decide when to return. I've actually lost track because there's quite a few people who've asked different questions about how uh, the foragers decide to um, uh, return. Well, they don't return until they find a seed. So um, something like 98% of foragers come back with a seed. So how long they are out uh, depends on how long it took them to find a seed. And that's why the rate at which they return is a good uh, cue to the availability of food. So they go out, they search, and once they find a seed, they turn around and come right back. Well, thank you, Deborah, and uh, I'm sure there will be many, uh, there's many more questions, so uh, it will be many more questions uh, in the in the uh, informal discussion, but I think because Great. we're running a little late, uh, we'll move now to Haisha's uh, uh, talk, and so now... Um, <laughs> so I uh, stopped sharing the screen here. Right, um, and, but thank you very much for a really interesting talk, and 